30th, 2020. Uh, we want to call the roll first, please. Yes, uh, yes, I'll go ahead and do that. Roberta Abdul Salam. Robbie Ash. Jim Duris. Roderick Edmund, William Floyd, Roderick Parson, Brian Glover, Jerry Griffin. Here. Frida Hardage. Here. Alicia Ivy. Russell McMurray. Here. John Pond. Present. Rita Scott. Present. Christopher Tomlinson. Here. Thomas Worthy. Thomas Worthy. Okay. Mr. Floyd. We have seven board members present. Okay. Uh, yes. First, I look them on the agenda. Approval of the June 25th minutes. Uh, in front of you, the copy of those minutes, or you've seen them, or the any additions or corrections to those minutes. This is Rita Hardage. I move to approve. Griffin second. And here, second by Jerry Griffin, I believe. Griffin. Yes. Uh, no, we're going the other way. Are there any abstentions from the vote for approval of the minutes? Are there any negative for approval of the minutes? Bring up the minutes are adopted. Jenna's okay. briefing for planning projects update by Shay Pearl, Director of Project Development. I am Shelly Pierce. I think this is the first time I've been able to address you. Um, so thank you for the opportunity. I am the director of project development in the planning department. And we wanted to take an opportunity um, since the calendars were kind of light this month to give you a, an update on the most active projects that we'll be um, advancing for fiscal year 21. Uh, can everybody see the slides? No. Jim, we can no. see you, not the slides. We can see me, but not the slides. Okay. Uh, okay, I was told this was going to be up, but if you'll give me a minute, I can pull it up myself. I'm sorry, guys. Mr. Chair, this is Rita Scott. Uh, let me say it may be some confusion as to the starting time. I received one email that said 9 a.m. attempt to join and another that said 9.30 a.m. with the meeting starting at 10. So just in case other board members join later, that may be the confusion. Um, good morning, Ms. Scott. This is uh, Marie speaking. Uh, um, WebEx correction, correction was um, sent out to um, board members. I understand, I but just, just in case they didn't see the correction, I wanted to stipulate that there was more than one. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. Shelly, we can see okay. the slides now. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, at, at this point, before I actually go into, this is our agenda for today, and um, I, we wanted to show you uh, just a reminder of where we are in the process, in the governance process, and the next slide I'm gonna pull up is gonna show stage gate three, and Mr. Rucker is gonna take a minute just to remind everybody of where we were, where we are. So, so as Shelly, we just, thank you, Shelly. As she just mentioned, we just really want to create that rigor within the organization of going through the governance process. So as we begin to make presentations on projects, we'll always remind the board as to what, what stage gate we are basically progressing. So in this case, we are progressing stage gate three. Now, just a reminder, we completed stage gate two, which basically we had a concept that was prioritized, included in the CIP, and authorized to proceed in planning. So in stage gate three, we basically both state of repair projects and expansion projects will have to go through some type of planning process. So, you know, we will have, whether it be internal planning groups or external, basically the deliverables and outputs will be a planning document, typically a, a preliminary engineering document, which is at 30%. We will have updates on the financial documents and charter. You know, we will have outreach to the community. We'll basically look at uh, and, and come to a decision on our locally preferred alternatives on some of these expansion projects. We will go through the environmental process as well as search safety certification. Uh, one thing that's very important, before we leave planning, we will be looking to lock down the budget for the overall project. You know, as we negotiate the planning process, we will give updates, and this is an update to the board. As Shelly said, we're looking at what our focus will be on 21 in fiscal year 21. And before we exit the planning process, there's an approval process where initially it goes through the, the chief of um, uh, capital programs as well as the AGMs. Eventually it goes to the market team, market board. All right, here we go. All right, I was just checking to see if they put that check in the mail yet. Mm. Okay, all right. So, so and, and be, be advised that any time as we start making submissions to FTA, the whole planning uh, report has to be approved by the MARTA board. So, Shelly, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Rucker. Okay, so the first project that we're going to, it's really a program that we're gonna uh, detail, give a little detail on, is the arterial rapid transit uh, program. We have two projects that we're progressing in this, and this is the Cleveland Avenue and Metropolitan. With the uh, arterial rapid transit program, we are trying to provide a 15 minute all day service. To do that, we will implement placing stations maybe around every quarter to half a mile along the corridor. And, and let me pause there for a second and, and kind of just give you a brief um, explanation of the corridor. I know you can see it on the maps in front of you, but the first quarter is, uh, or the, the vertical line in blue is metropolitan. And that starts from the West End station and goes all the way into the city of Hapeville. The horizontal line that you see in, in option one, and I think that's also in blue, I'm not sure what my, I, I think it is blue as well. That starts from the East Point statement and goes to the Browns Mill Golf Course and circles it and comes back down. And that is the area that we're looking at. The three alignments that you see on here are the work that we're planning to continue focusing on for fiscal 21 and making sure that we, we choose the right scenario that will best serve uh, the area that is, that is being represented. So for for fiscal year 21, we're gonna be focused on working with GDOT and municipal uh, partners, confirming the alignment, and also advancing station design and detailing out the cost estimates to do each of these alignments and then making that choice. So that's our first program. And as I go along, if there are any questions, just please stop me. I'm, I'm not gonna to go too fast, hopefully, and not too slow, but if you do have questions, I'd be happy to try and answer as I go along. Our second um, project that we wanted to give you an update on is for the Campton Corridor. Now the Campton Corridor happens to be one of the busiest um, routes that we have um, in, in MARTA for our services and that's our route uh, 83. Here we are planning to design a 
high capacity transit um, corridor. We don't know, of course, what the mode is gonna be just yet. And this corridor will take us along from the Greenbrier to Oakland City Station. And even though I say Greenbrier, if you notice on, on your maps, you'll see Ben Hill highlighted. We're actually gonna start the project at the Bard Road area and come around to Greenbrier where we're proposing right now nine stops. And those you'll see from the dots going along Campbellton are right now what's being proposed. Of course, this nothing is set in stone. These can change, um, but that's what we're looking at right now. So for fiscal 21, we're gonna begin a detailed analysis of the corridor, trying to determine what the mode, the transit lanes will look like, the alignment, the stations, and also we'll be working with the real estate department to help develop a strategy for uh, transit oriented development along the station and that station area. The next project that I wanted to bring to your attention is Streetcar East. Now Streetcar, as you know, um, is a project that started with the city of Atlanta and uh, it's now under MARTA leadership. We wanna take the Streetcar East extension to Pont City Market. So as you see from the map here, and, and again, I'm sorry, let me pause and point out that this was a project that was started by the Atlanta Beltline. And we are working in coordination with the city of Atlanta and Atlanta Beltline to study the extension along Edgewood to the Beltline corridor, and that would be the in street portion. And then we would at Irwin Street jump on the right of way for Beltline, and that would take us to Pond City Market. We wanna focus in 21, in fiscal 21, on confirming this alignment. Uh, we may make a few changes to it based on purely transit and community needs. And we wanna advance the station design and come up with what a really good figure is gonna to be to move the project forward. This project um, is one that we're planning on um, doing with all local dollars. Shelly, just, yes, just to point out, uh, this, the actual, we are looking at moving the final design before the end of the year, right? Yes, we will surely have, I think, our 30% going into our actual calendar year 21. Yes, sir. Okay, all right, okay. Okay. The next project is one that's very active. Um, we had a very successful meeting last night, and um, if anybody is not aware, we have another meeting, a virtual meeting, coming up this Saturday at 12 o'clock. It's the Connect the Core, and you can find details on MARTA's website. The Summer Hill Bus Rapid Transit me, um, uh, project goes from the Atlanta Beltline, which is, I'm sorry, did I have a question? No? Okay. Goes from the Atlanta Beltline uh, University Avenue to, to downtown Atlanta. We are anticipating having approximately, as it says, about 84% dedicated um, rights of way. Uh, this will be a first for us in, in, in the city. We'll have about 12 stations. Um, this project is really advanced. We are anticipating completing our 30% design on this around September and going into final design in October, November of this year. Uh, so we're really excited about this project. It's one that we've been talking about for a few years and um, just happy to get it going and keep it going. Another project which is close to the Summerhill BRT is the North Shelly. Avenue Bus Rapid Transit. Yes. Shelly, on, have a question? On this, yes, on the Summer, this is Chris Tomlinson. On the Summerhill BRT. Hi, yes. Hey, and, and good to see and, and, and hear you, Shelley been a while. Um, on the Summerhill BRT, um, can you expound a little bit more on the where things are with the station design as well as the um, or any information on the vehicle type since obviously that's going to factor into the station design? Okay. So I can tell you that the, the vehicles that we're considering uh, for Summerhill are all going to be electric. <clears throat> And so I know that will, like you said, um, determine what our stations are gonna look like. Uh, we are anticipating um, proposing, uh, the stations are gonna look somewhat like, and I, I, I don't have the slides to show you right now. They're, they're gonna be your typical bus rapid transit stations. The ones that we've been showing the general public are examples of what you see in Minneapolis. Now, it's not gonna look like that. We may have some different 
um, features, uh, all those things haven't been decided yet. We will be coming uh, to the board with um, a presentation that will highlight guidelines that we're going to be using at each and every one of the bus rapid transit and arterial stations and, and also uh, light rail stations in the very near future. So I'd say look forward to that. Um, I don't have um, a picture of what that's going to look like right now, but I'd be happy to um, get that to you. Hopefully that answers the question a, a little bit for you. Yeah, no, that's helpful. And I'll, I'll definitely be very interested in, in that presentation or talking more about it. So thank you. You're welcome, sir. Okay. Our next project uh, is the North Avenue Bus Rapid Transit Project. Now here it says it's the North Avenue Operation and Improvement Project Phase 1. So if you'll give me a minute to explain. So North Avenue Bus Rapid Transit, our BRT project, um, is still ongoing. But the, we decided that we were going to try and do it a little bit differently uh, by doing a quick build, as it says on your screens, uh, operational improvements along the corridor. Uh, this is just another way of saying we're going to maybe test this out to see what we can do from an operational standpoint, uh, you know, help out the local services along there. So working with the city of Atlanta, as you know, they've passed, I'm not sure if it's passed yet, so let me say they're working on an ordinance for the commissioner of uh, the Atlanta DOT, I'm sorry, yes, ACL, to actually, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm drawing a blank here dedicate right-of-way lanes for us. Um, we're hoping that North Avenue will be one of the first ones, if not Summer Hill, to, to get that designation, to have both only lanes. And so what we're going to focus on for fiscal 21 is to build out these operation improvements. You may see um, uh, plastic bollards, you may see red paint. We're not sure yet what's going to be out there for the operational improvements. And then on the planning side of things, what we're going to focus on is working with GDOT, working with the city, working with our local stakeholders and the general public on what the alignment is going to be. Uh, we know it's going to be along North Avenue, but then we don't know exactly where we're going to start, where we're going to end, where we're going to turn around. So we're going to focus on that this year. So this is going to be a twofold. We'll be working on the planning phase and we'll also be advancing the operational improvement uh, through advancing and up, uh, it's your a &E services here, but it's actually the design contract. So we'll be doing both things at the same time, just to advance the larger project that is the North Avenue Bus Rapid Transit. The next project I want to talk to you about, uh, actually two coming up that are going to be on the, the, the same um, theme. These are area uh, improvements to existing stations. So for Bankhead Station, uh, as you know, it's, it's, an, it's an existing two-car station, and we want to try to make it more consistent with all the other stations um, at MARTA. So we're trying to get this one to an eight-car length. It's either going to be a six or an eight-car length. We're going to focus on uh, this year confirming the recommended station design concepts that we have. And I'm not sure if you can tell from the, the, the pictures that you see on your screen. Uh, this is, and I'm not very technical, but you can see from the concept here, we'll be kind of building into the Gary Avenue and creating a whole new station, something that will be there for everybody in the community to really enjoy and, and get some good usage out of. Plus, of course, we'll be getting more cars along the um, track itself. So our focus this year is going to be on confirming the station design and then advancing that design and also coming up with a detailed cost estimate to implement. Our other uh, station enhancement that we're working on is for the five point station in downtown Atlanta. Here, we're focusing on deconstructing the existing canopy and reconnecting Broad Street from Marietta to Alabama, and also working with our real estate department and the city of Atlanta on transit oriented development for that area. We want to focus on um, completing the uh, preliminary design, which is taking it to 5% by. I think they're going to be done with that by September of this year. And we'll be procuring a design firm to do the rest of the, the design itself. We'll start that in November of this year. We'll also be procuring a CMR to work along with the design firm to on um, the design for the transformation of Five Point Station. And as you can see from your rendering, basically what we're going to be doing is taking that cap off of Five Point, and you'll see what we hope 
will be like a reconnection of Broad Street, and that's going to really going to bring that area to life a, a whole lot more, make it more pedestrian as well. Now we move into Clayton County. In Clayton County, this is a very important facility that we're undertaking. We're, we're going to be doing the Clayton County Operations and Maintenance Facility. We have been planning and designing and going through um, with our, I'm sorry, do I have a question? No? Okay. All right. We are planning and designing the implementation of a multipurpose operations and maintenance facility. Uh, we're looking at this year, work, continuing our work with the real estate department on acquisition of a piece of property that we've identified. We'll be doing utilities and site serving, uh, advancing a design and refining what the cost is going to be. The facility that we've identified, we, we don't know yet if we're going to need to tear it down completely or maybe we can reuse some of, of the building structure, but that's some of the work that we'll be focused on for fiscal 21. Also in Clinton County is our high capacity transit work that we're doing. Um, we are focusing on, and this, this, for this particular project, the commuter rail transit. Uh, I know that ever since I moved to Atlanta, I've been hearing about getting a commuter line from East Point all the way down to Lovejoy and then continuing it all the way down to Macon and other places. And hopefully this is one that we can do. But for fiscal 21, we're gonna focus on just completing our baseline conditions report our purpose and need statement, which we'll need for FDA for, you know, to try to get FDA dollars. We'll be doing our environmental assessment and just trying to see if we have the density and the capacity to actually build out uh, a commuter rail in Clayton County. So that work will definitely keep rolling on for fiscal 21. Also in Clayton County, we are studying the implementation of bus rapid transit along the corridor. Um, we have identified that there is a lot of need, as you know, in Clayton County. And what we're looking at now for bus rapid transit is on more on the west side. So we'll be following generally the routes that we have um, in operation right now, routes 191 and 196. And as you know, with bus rapid transit, the, we have to have a minimum of at least 50% exclusive lanes dedicated in order to have some kind of difference. It's bus rapid. So it's gonna be a little bit um, more efficient service than our local service. So we're, these are the things that we're looking at along the corridor, which corridors we can find that can provide, uh, you know, 50% or more exclusive exclusivity for the lanes. So we're gonna focus on doing a concept design, working on NEPA, beginning our environmental assessment for fiscal 21 to keep that project moving. And again, staying in, Clayton, we are going to be working with Clayton County and the municipalities on a support, a land use supportive plan. We're, it, the end result of this, what we're trying to do is come up with um, zoning language, zoning ordinances that each jurisdiction can tailor for themselves so that this piece will help to support, we hope, you know, the, the commuter rails and the bus rapid transit along the corridor. We'll be working with real estate in their, um, in our shop, of course, and then in, in the municipalities to develop PODs along the stations if, if we are successful in pushing along commuter rail. And with that is the end of the, the, the more active projects that we're pushing along for fiscal 21. Of course, there are other projects that we're also working on. And uh, I, I thank you for your time. If, you, if there are any questions, Yes. Question. This is yes. okay. Ms. Pearl. Yeah. Hi. This Can is read Rita. It, please. Thank you. Um, I have a question. I understand, and I heard you say there are other programs and projects that you're working on, and I know I will receive calls asking. I did not hear any plans for any projects in DeKalb. Uh, Shannon, let me let me try, let me try to answer that. All right. Sure. So so Mrs. Scott, um, DeKalb County. So what Shell has given us an update on are the expansion programs. So the city of Atlanta and 
the Clayton County expansion. So those are, are separate funding sources. Uh, for DeKalb County, it's all state of good repair money. So some of the things we're focused on there, of course, would be the bus stop amenities, uh, which are the shelters and, and, and seats, et cetera. So we got a big shelter program going on in DeKalb County right now, uh, as well as we got the CMRs working to look at the uh, Indian Creek Station, and we anticipate as, as committed to be out at Indian, Indian Creek doing station rehabilitation works before the end of the year. So, so as well as we got numerous planning efforts going on um, uh, throughout the course of the year to look at the CAB, Stonecrest Transit Centers, basically South of the CAB Transit Centers. So we are doing a lot of different work, but it's not shown in this presentation because this presentation is geared towards the expansion works, which are separately funded. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Ms. For Ms. Pearl or? Appreciate that. Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much. I'm on the agenda is a resolution authorizing an award for the procurement of needle point bipolar ionization for GPS devices. The request for proposal is P is in Paul 47269. Connie Chris Sack, Director Architectural and Design Centers. Please. Uh, good morning. Let me see how um, I'm trying to get my screen screen to share. Here we go. Okay. All right, good morning, everyone. My name is Connie Krusak, and I am the Director of Architecture and Design for Capital Improvements. I also serve in MARTA's Back to Work Task Force, and today I will be presenting an air purification system and request the approval of the resolution authorizing the award of a single source contract for the procurement of the needle point bipolar ionization system by Global Plasma Solutions. In order to bring employees safely back to the workforce, the following initiatives are being implemented. One is temperature checks, um, the CDC recommendations of distancing and mask, employee surveys, office and work station configurations, the clean start program, and finally the air filtration of MARTA facilities. MARTA's engineering department was tasked with recommending a system that would purify the air at all of MARTA's air-conditioned facilities. The system that is being recommended is the needle point bipolar ionization by Global Plasma Solutions that is a local Georgia company and is based in Savannah. This system provides clean air while breaking down bacteria and viruses. It purifies indoor air by elim eliminating airborne particulates, odors, and pathogens, including mold. And it delivers clean indoor air that is safe and healthy, producing neither ozone nor other harmful byproducts. So the way this system works is that the air is purified by using electrostatic devices and they supply voltage that produce an ionization field. As these ions travel with the airstream, they attach to particles, pathogens, viruses, and gases. This process of ionization eliminates viruses. Finally, the ions that are produced naturally break down unhealthy bacteria and mold, and any virus subsequent becomes inactive. A thorough comp comparison was made with other filtering devices and the needle point bipolar ionization proved to be the most efficient and advantageous system. Of particular note is that the recommended device is installed inside the air handling unit and this allows the air to be purified at the source unlike the other systems that are being installed at the ductworks. 
The system is also UL certified and it has done thorough testing in the killing of the COVID-19 virus. Oops. Sorry. Okay. So um, there are, in MARTA, there are 18 facilities that are listed on the right hand that will be receiving these units. In total, there's 209 units of the air handling units that will receive each device. And they require four different types of this device to meet the handling needs of the tonnage capacity of air. The cost of the system is $600,000 and MARTA's um, internal cost is two fifty. dollars The whole system will cost $850,000 to install. Um, these installations are really simple to do. Um, they're very quickly done. They probably in a matter of hours, you can install one of these units. So we'll be able to get this done rather quickly. Um, at this point, um, I can answer any questions that you may you may have, and I will respectfully request the approval of the resolution to authorize the award of a single source contract for the procurement of the needle point bipolar ionization system by Global Plasma Solutions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions concerning this? I feel glad to get an explanation of what that was. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> okay, good morning. This is Larry Prescott, Senior Director of Infrastructure Engineering. Yeah, the this is the way I like to break it down is it's kind of like an electronic Febreze. Uh, <laughs> these devices get stuck into the HVAC system and they do an electrostatic charge and all the particles going through the, the system and they're broken down and, and they can no longer uh, be utilized as a, as a pathogen or mold or anything like that. So the filtration system picks it up and they no longer exist. And it's clean and safe because it's oxygen doing all the work for us. And so the bipolar is the positive and negative ions are all covered. So it covers all kinds of the breakdown of pathogens. And the picture that she showed the four devices, they're very small, it's about the set the the power usage is less than uh, you know, having a light bulb stuck into your HVAC system. And that's what makes them so efficient. The single source that we're going for is basically uh, uh, one company that does all four devices and can cover all of our facilities at one time, rather than going to multiple vendors for different for the four different types. Does that help? Okay. Rod right, Fry, a question. Maybe Larry can answer this. Uh, are these units installed in other other transit facilities? Are they installed in other places? I can answer that. Yes, they uh, they have been installed at most all of the Atlanta public school system, all of their all of their schools, uh, the White House, um, a lot of medical centers, a lot of hospitals. Um, yes, they are installed in many yes. many places. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, is there a motion then for approval of this resolution? I'm over approval. Griffin. Con seconds. Con Any other discussion? Vote for this resolution. Negative votes for this resolution. Hearing resolution. For presentation to the board. Next item on the agenda is the resolution authorizing the approval to execute a memo of understanding, an MOU with the City of Forest Park related to the activity for the Clayton County Multiple Purpose Operations and Maintenance. Robin Boyd, Director of Real Estate. Robin? Hi, can everyone sure. hear me? Can everyone hear me? Sure. Yes, yes, okay. I, I apologize for not turning on my video. I have a brand new computer and the camera apparently doesn't work. So I'm, I'm the director of real estate and today I'm asking for, um, for 
MARTA to execute of understanding with the city of Forest Park. Can, can you see the um, my screen also, the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. This is in relation to the Clayton County maintenance facility. And just at the very beginning of the acquisition process. So when we get to the point where we actually identify properties to um, acquire and we come to the board and ask for permission to make purchase offers, we fully expect that we will be able to negotiate with the owners for a fair and equitable purchase. And that's how we're proceeding and that's our goal. But we understand that things don't always work out that way. And so we may have to request condemnation from the jurisdiction in question. And right now we already have a partnership with Clayton County through the um, rapid transit contract and assistance agreement. But Forest Park is not a signatory to that, that agreement. So we were trying to just in the spirit of being proactive and having all of our ducks in a row on the front end, we approached Forest Park and, and they were on board. So last Monday, July 20th, their um, council adopted the resolution. And on the 23rd, their mayor signed the MOU. And so right now we are coming to the board asking for authority for MARTA's general manager to also execute that memo of understanding with Forest Park. Does anyone have any questions? Is that, Robin, is that the same property that we've been talking about? I didn't realize that was in the forest, in the city of Forest Park. Uh, I don't know what property you're yeah, yeah, referencing. Yeah, yes, uh, the answer to that is yes. All the okay. all the presentations where we've shown yeah. you, which, you know, gotten down to a single right. property, this, this is the okay. property. All right. I would certainly like to move approval of that of that motion of that proposal. I've, I've heard a motion for approval. Did I hear that? Need to move this project. Second, second, Rod Frierson. Frierson and I, Doctor, I believe you're. Are you on the call now? I am on the call. Not make the roll, but I'd like I to relinquish. It's your meeting, so it's come back over to you. Hey, uh, go ahead and finish up today, uh, Mayor. All right. Resolution and uh, second, a motion and a second. Are there any other discussion on this resolution? If hey, not, Bill, are there Bill, any abstentions? Sorry, Bill, no this is Thomas Work. I just wanted to, I, I missed the roll call as well, and I just wanted to, I, I'm in support of this motion. I just wanted the record to reflect that I'm here as well. Okay, thank it, you. It looks like it. It looks like that since the roll call, this is Frida, since the roll call, we've got Dr. F Mr. Frierson, Dr. Edmund, and Thomas Worthy that have all joined us. Okay, thank you. Okay, all right, that's good to clear the records up with that. So are there any abstentions to the vote on this resolution? Are there any negative vote to this resolution? Here is adopted. And Dr. Edmonds, we are on Resolution or item number five. This is the resolution authorizing the execution of an amendment to King Memorial Transit over orient, oriented development ground lease. And I will turn the I'll turn the chair back over to you, please. <laughs> Mayor, I'm gonna ask if you could just go ahead and, and, and share the remainder of this meeting. I'm, I'm kind of like moving and I'm, I'm not in a place where I, I can do this. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. I will be happy then with it. Say again, we're on item five, which is a resolution authorizing the execution of an amendment in Memorial transit oriented grant lease. Debbie Frank, director of transit oriented development. Uh, the floor is yours, please. Debbie. Yes, thank you. Can everyone hear me? Can you hear me? I can. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Good morning. 
Yes, good morning, Chairman um, Edmund, Vice Chair Floyd, Ms. Hardich, Ms. Hardich, committee members, Mr. Parker and Mr. Rucker. You have before you this morning for consideration of approval, a resolution authorizing execution of an amendment to the King Memorial TOD ground lease. This resolution my PowerPoint. Okay. This resolution would result in the fifth amendment to the ground lease agreement. As you, as we shared during the executive <laughs> session, Martyrs Development Partner is seeking financial support for unexpected site conditions discovered after construction began in January of this year. Those site conditions include increase in contaminated soil, much more debris filled soil, increase in water removal, and a need to increase soil import due to the deficit created from soil removal. You may recall in October of 2018, the board approved a cost sharing of up to $800,000 for environmental remediation of the site. And this was based on findings from our environmental assessment. Again, today's request is the result of unexpected site conditions discovered after the start of construction. Staff recommends a structure that would provide financial relief not to exceed $375,000 to the developer through a deferred ground lease payment for 24 months. MARTA's financial support to the developer is not free. The deferred ground lease payment will accrue interest. MARTA will earn additional ground lease rent for a period up to the first five years of the 99 year ground lease. Staff is requesting board approval for of the resolution authorizing the execution of the fifth amendment to the King Memorial TOD ground lease. And with that, um, this concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Any questions for Ms. Frank? Uh, all right, hearing none, uh, is there a re motion for approval of the re resolution? Al Pond for approval. This is Freya Hardage. I will second for the, as I would say, the fifth and final amendment to this ground lease. <laughs> all right. Her second, is there any other discussion or concerning this issue? None. The any mentions to the vote for this resolution. Any votes for this resolution? Resolution is adopted. Thank you very much. Thank you. Move to resolution six, uh, six, which is the final item on the agenda today. Resolution on to enter into negotiations with Portman Holdings LLC for development of parcel D as in dog 3044 at North Avenue Station. RFP P is in all 43033. Uh, Jacob Ballow, Senior Director, Transit Oriented Development and Re Real Estate. Jacob, are you there? Please, the floor. Yes. yes, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Edmund. Vice Chairman Floyd, Madam Chair Hartage, Mr. Parker, and members of the committee. We are here today to request approval of the resolution authorizing the authority <clears throat> to enter into negotiations with Portman Holdings for the development of parcel D3044 at North Avenue Station, request for proposals P43033. As you know, from our executive di session discussions, our request follows a competitive process managed by JLL and our procurement department, as well as a review of the Portman Holdings proposal by the Source Evaluation Committee and JLL, our advisor. The proposal meets or exceeds our fair market value of the most recent appraisal obtained by MARTA conforms to both our TOD guidelines and policy in the City of Atlanta zoning and parking codes 
and further Portman Holdings has a deep track record of executing complex projects and financing projects structured with a ground lease. Upon your approval to negotiate, we will proceed to do so and we will keep the board apprised of our progress along the way. As a reminder, staff must work with Portman Holdings to finalize a development program and ground lease terms and then return to committee and the board to request your approval to authorize the general manager to execute definitive documents, including a term sheet and ground lease. We respectfully request your approval of the resolution authorizing the authority to enter into negotiations with Portman Holdings for the development of parcel D3044 at North Avenue Station, request for proposals P43033. Thank you. Would just a clarification on a couple of items since there's been a lot of discussion about this issue. One is we're being asked to enter into discussions with Portman, but there has been some restriction on what you've allowed been allowed to talk to Portman about over the past few months. Is that correct? That's correct. We we received the proposal. We were able to ask questions, but beyond that period of asking questions. Immediately after the receipt of the proposal, we are uh, by process uh, forbid to speak to the to the uh, proponent. So, asking us to be clear, what you're asking us to approve today is approval to begin discussions. We're not approving the project in any way. We're simply being asked, or being, we're being asked to allow you to enter in discussions concerning a lot of different items of this project. Correct. There's so the it's it's both the award, but the award to allow us to then negotiate with Portman Holdings, and then we have to you return have to the board. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yes, and then and then we have to return and report back to the board um, the results of our negotiations. Frame might be i i don't specifically i know that um you know the the marta team and the portman holdings team uh would like to move this forward as quickly as possible so i um i'm hopeful it could be you know sometime in the next uh, 60 to 90 days if not sooner okay all right thank you are there any other questions for jacob ballo Yes. Hi. Um, this is the Rita Scott. Are you saying 60 to 90 days to start the conversations or you would be able to update the MARTA board within 60 to 90 days? Uh, thank you for the clarification. I meant update the board. Uh, so the board, just so I have it clear in my mind, the board would receive updates within 60 to 90 days regarding the ongoing conversations. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Questions for Mr. Bell. Hey, this, this, this is Dr. Edmund, and I just want to really preserve the record as, as you all probably know, I've got questions about you know, this, this, this process. And you know, again, it may be just based upon pure ignorance on my part, but I, I really have misgivings over the fact we paid a consultant, you know, a substantial amount of money, and we only got one bidder on, on a big project like this. And I don't believe in my heart of hearts that there's any way that Marta can get the best uh, bang for their buck and the best economic uh, result when there's only one bidder. And, and I've looked at the process. A lot of questions have been asked. I mean, there's been you know, statements made about how how the process was competitive and that irrespective of only one better putting in a bid, you know, it, it, we, we got some kind of economic benefit. But again, I just, I just, I find it hard to believe. I'm not calling anybody liars, but in, in my 58 years of living, you know, I, I, the only time that I see where we, we really, where institutions get the benefit of competition is when there's actually competition and there's more than one better. So, I'm just putting that on the record. 
All right, thank you, Dr. Edmonds. Uh, any other comments or questions? Yeah, Rob, Bill, I have one question for uh, Jacob, this is Alphon. Jacob, I alluded uh, before, wanted some clarification. When we negotiate in the criteria, I assume there will be some performance milestones and if the uh, if the Portman does not proceed with the project, uh, just kind of delays, 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 there will be a mechanism where MARTA could go to someone else, I assume, correct? Yes, we would. That's correct. We'd have mechanisms to uh, terminate the negotiations, terminate the term sheet, and uh, redo the RFP process. That's correct. Right. And I'm alluding once the contract is signed, if they go through a planning process but uh, do not execute the project in a timely manner, there are some mechanisms there to, to make a change. That's correct. Thank you. Any other questions for Mr. Powell? Asking for a motion to move this resolution to the board. Is it here for that? El Pond, I move for approval. Black Frierson second. Motion approved. Frierson second. Any other discussion or comments? Or are there any extensions to the vote for this resolution? Negative votes for this resolution. Dr. Edmund, negative. Right. Any other negative votes for this resolution? Good. It approved with one negative vote by Dr. Edmonds. Uh, Mr. Vallow, and this uh, concludes, uh, I don't have anything else on the agenda for today. That. that is correct. <laughs> that is correct. Then uh, is there a motion for adjournment of this planning committee? Move. The move. Griffin. Uh, uh, motion for and we're adjourned and we're moving into the next meeting and I'm not sure what that is. So <laughs> Dr. Gr Mr. Griffin. All right. Somebody want to put an agenda up? Yes, sir. We'll have the operations agenda up in just a second. Nice short agenda today. Okay, let me call the meeting of the Operations and Safety Committee to order. And uh, would you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Roberta Abdul Salam. Robbie Ash. Jim Durant. Rod Rick Edmund. Present. William Floyd. Per William Floyd. Roderick Fireson. Ryan Glover, Jerry Griffin, here, Frida Hardage, present, Alicia Ivy, Russell McMurray, John Pond, present. Rita Scott. Present. Christopher Tomlinson. Thomas Worthy. Present.
Mr. Griffin, we have nine board members present. Excellent. Can I get a, an approve, motion to approve the minutes of the June 25th, 2020 meeting? Frida Hardage, I move to approve. Got a motion, second? Second, Rod Frierson. Okay, got a motion and second. Are there any, are there any abstentions? Are there any no votes? Minutes are approved. All right, the first item on the uh, agenda, Gina Majors, AGM for Safety and Quality Assurance, will talk about the QMS program. Good morning, good morning. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Please. Right now, I'm surprised. All right. Am I, is everyone able to see my screen? We are. <clears throat> okay. Greetings, Chairman Griffin, Mr. Parker, and members of the Ops and Safety Committee. I'm Gina Major, AGM for the Department of Safety and Quality Assurance. And while our department is uh, collectively referred to as safety, today's briefing is going to be from the quality side of our house. I previously served as the director of quality assurance before becoming the AGM. And one of our strategic initiatives was the implementation of a quality management system and to have the system ISO certified. So today I'm going to review the mechanics of a quality management system and discuss the journey that we've been on towards ISO certification. So um, a quality management system is a formalized system that documents processes, procedures, and responsibilities for achieving quality policies and objectives. Now, the genesis of quality management has reached that date back to the 1920s when skilled workers would evaluate uh, the work product of journeymen and apprentices, but it grew wings in more modern day manufacturing through quality gurus such as Edward Demings, Joseph Duran, and other birthers of the total quality management or TQM movement. So for a quick station break, um, many of you may know the story and, and others may not, the story that uh, uh, TQM was initially ignored by the Western world, but the Japanese took a keen interest in utilizing it to improve their products, um, which were considered poor quality and imitation. Uh, Japanese would go on to lead in the area of quality and ultimately succeed in knocking General Motors from their top selling position um, as the number one automaker for, for almost a century, um, seven decades, and they, they lost the title uh, to the Japanese in, in 2009. Now I'll hang here for a second longer because I was born and raised in Flint, Michigan, which is the birthplace um, of General Motors. I am a graduate of what was formerly known as General Motors Institute and I worked for General Motors for almost uh, 20 years. So I lived and breathed the dominance of the Japanese automakers um, on our heels. Um, <clears throat> I grew up uh, with General Motors actually starting uh, from high school. And um, although I graduated with a BS in electrical engineering, I was placed in quality assurance uh, under other duties uh, as assigned. And so the rest is truly history. I, I have been um, uh, in, in quality for uh, the majority of my um, career. So why, why is the QMS um, important? And we're, sh we're shown here, but it's important because we've got to have a standard to how we conduct work and uh, whether it's making a widget or uh, providing a service. And that's what the Japanese taught the world and they're still dominating today actually because of it. Um, but I will talk about what this looks like at MARTA a little later in this briefing. So ISO um, is the International Organization for Standardization. It is the world's largest developer of voluntary international standards. 
Uh, they were founded in 1947, and as you might expect, <clears throat> their initial role focused heavily on mechanical engineering and manufacturing. Um, the word ISO, <clears throat> excuse me, is derived from the Greek word isis, uh, which means equal. And the thought is that if two items meet the same standard, they would be equal. So ISO's role is uh, is similar. It's similar to that of a of an orchestra conductor. Uh, whereby the orchestra itself is made up of independent um, technical experts. So drilling down a little bit, ISO 9001 is the internationally recognized standard for quality management systems. And there are other standards, and I'll give an example of those as well. Um, ISO 9001 2015 represents the most current revision of the standard and it delivers a model for managing and improving a unit um, or, or organization. Um, but e examples of other quality management standards, are, or for example, quality management standards um, are to help work more efficiently and reduce uh, product failures. Environmental management standards help reduce environmental um, impacts and footprints, reduce waste. Um, there's health and safety standards. There are uh, energy management standards, um, so on and, and so forth. So within MARTA, we have two other uh, certified management uh, systems, uh, which include EMS, our environmental management system, and AMS, our asset management um, system. And as mentioned, all management systems are about adherence to standards and fostering uh, continuous improvement. So um, I, I, I do want to give some, some kudos here. An environmental management system, again, is a set of processes that enable an organization to re reduce its environmental impacts. Now, our environmental management system here at MARTA is led by Ms. Karen Lester, who is a member of the DSQA team. Uh, Karen helped lead us to our certification in 2016. And in 2017, MARTA was the first uh, U.S. transit agency to receive multi-site certification. Um, over the past four years, MARTA has received certification in nine bus, rail, and administrative facilities. And we have two facilities up next, um, Hamilton Bus Maintenance and Browns Mill um, Heavy Maintenance Facilities uh, to, to add to the multi-site certification. <clears throat> Um, an asset management system uh, is, is short um, or in short is the process a company or organization uses to keep track of equipment and inventory. And our asset management system here at MARTA is led by Ms. Teresa Ray, who is a member of the capital improvement uh, teams. Now she led us through the obtainment of our first AMS certification last year. Um, so in 2019, MARTA was the first transit organization in the Americas and the 15th transport company globally uh, to receive certification. Uh, Teresa is now the co-lead for the Atlanta branch of the Institute of Asset Management, and she sits on the board for the North American Women in Asset Management. So we've got some pretty awesome trailblazers leading the way in ISO certification right here at MARTA. Okay, so some key benefits of the QMS system are shown on the screen here. I want to talk about all of those. I'll say my favorite surprise is going through the process of um, in, in going through the process of formalizing our QMS was our first ever customer satisfaction survey. So DSQA sent um, a survey out to our stakeholders and got some uh, some good but surprising feedback. The feedback was favorable in general, but it was um, revealing to watch the natural reaction from our leadership team and wanting to do better um, regarding the opportunities for improvement. So I, I would say um, for me, it was it was in that moment that I realized we had pretty much turned the corner per se in terms of walking the talk with regard to having a QMS. Um, this is an important milestone uh, from the perspective because ISO Certification is, of course, not a requirement uh, for implementing and formalizing a QMS. Um, you know, however, I think that if we were not seeking certification, 
I know that we probably would not have commenced um, such a survey um, as an example as it just wasn't on our radar. So um, there's definitely some benefits uh, to, to having that carrot of certification and ensuring um, that our practices remain in place. So I like to say that DSQA um, serves as the authority's internal consultant, and, and, we, and that's pretty much um, exactly what we do. Um, so with that, MARTA is the primary customer of DSQA. Our internal customers are our stakeholders uh, within the department itself, and then the external uh, uh, customers are our are, are, are MARTA stakeholders. Um, so, for example, like our writing public, um, of course, everything that we do is, is ultimately uh, to, to serve our writing uh, public, but they are not considered uh, a part of our, our customer base with, within our um, QMS. Um, and so if you think about internal consultants, they work within the corporate structure to resolve business issues and implement uh, solutions in organizational effectiveness and development, uh, strategic planning or process improvement. Um, they also serve as change agents, coaches, um, educators, or facilitators uh, within the company. And that, that is very much in line uh, with what we do. So um, we do have a quality policy statement. It's uh, on the screen there, and that's um, uh, required actually for, uh, for, for certification. And it, it, it allows us to remember um, uh, what we stand for and, and what we do. But what I'd like to um, focus on is the fact that we actually have uh, uh, services that, that we provide and in, in are required to outline those um, services within the, Q, within the QMS. Um, so our three primary services are safety services, quality assurance services, and configuration management services. Um, some of our some of our services under safety, I won't um, read them all off, but you probably are mostly aware of our uh, accident and incident investigation whenever we do have an accident or incident, whether it's um, a bus or rail. Um, we assist with emergency preparedness, um, hazard management, um, and, and as I referred to earlier, um, our environmental uh, or EMS. Under quality assurance services, we do provide capital improvement oversight. Uh, this is a hyperlink that's highlighted here. I'm actually gonna gonna show a video um, at the end of the presentation of one of our MARTA heroes, Jeff Cody, who is a quality assurance engineer. And I think it, it'll it'll be great because one of the things we often hear is, well, what what do you guys actually do in in quality? So I think this will be a good demonstration um, of that. Um, we also help with maintenance planning, um, doing um and inspections of, of uh, parts and products that come into our our uh, facilities or our stores and then um overall continuous uh in improvement efforts are done out of our um, quality assurance uh service as well and then on configuration management services we have document control um, we also support capital improvement projects with maintaining um our, our as built or or baseline drawings so those are our, our formal, or the outline of our formal services. All right, um, so in talking about our, our journey uh, towards QMS certification, it's really been done in five phases. And those five phases are shown here. Um, we spent most of our time in phase two and phase three. Um, we actually started the journey towards QMS certification probably almost um, two years ago with some fits and starts, um, but we were able to focus uh, more specifically on it for, I would say, the past um, past year, maybe eight, eight to nine months. Um, so right now, we are in, in phase four. Actually, we just finished phase four. We just completed um, what's referred to as the stage one and the stage two audits. Um, stage one is a more minor audit to make sure that you're ready for stage two, and stage two is the um, in intensive uh, part of the certification audit. Uh, we came out of the audit with uh, six findings, two major findings, um, and four minor findings. 
Now that's um, actually not too shabby. Most uh, uh, most initial certifications uh, audits come out with anywhere from from 16 uh, to 20 findings. Now the good news here is we just received word um, just earlier uh, uh, this week that our findings, our submission uh, to resolve the findings um, have been accepted uh, by the registrar. It's extremely good news because that means that um, we should be receiving our, our certification probably uh, within the next 30 to 60 days. Being able to resolve and close out those findings um, uh, was critical. So we, we're, we're doing a half happy dance. We don't want to do it all the way till, we, till we've got it, um, but that's where we are. Uh, uh, in the uh, certification process. All right. So the timing of our QMS certification um, is really a, a, a prelude for SMS. So SMS is the safety management system that is being implemented across all rail transit agencies uh, per federal rule 673 and 674. And I've spoken to you guys um, a few times about that. But many of you may not know that SMS began with the aviation industry and is rooted um, and birthed out of uh, QMS. So QMS um, uh, really is the, is the foundation, if you will, um, for SMS. So um, while a QMS is a means of ensuring that an organization is meeting requirements and continuously improving its processes, uh, the QMS has already established many of those processes that the SMS requires, um, such as management review, analysis of data, corrective actions, um, and internal audits. So improvements to our QMS to fully meet SMS requirements um, include establishing processes to better identify new hazards, um, and establishing processes to ensure the effectiveness of our safety risk controls. Um, so safety management and quality management are highly complementary and work closely, closely together to achieve the overall safety goals of the authority. And again, on the, on the um, shared foundation, uh, both systems, again, are complementary management tools that contribute to the enhancement of safety um, and focus on uh, some of the items uh, listed here. Um, and that at the end of the day, again, you, you cannot have an effective SMS without applying QMS principles. So, Mr. John Ruskin, who was an English critic, essayist, and reformer, said that quality is never an accident. It is always the result of intelligent efforts. We agree. And um, DSQA, we actually, our catchphrase from our uh, 2019 uh, tagline or slogan competition, um, safe by choice, not by chance. Um, is, is where we stand, and you will hear that a little bit more as we uh, roll out um, the implementation of SMS. But I promised you all um, a video on Mr. Jeff Cody. He is one of our quality assurance engineers and is currently working on the, uh, the, life, the rail car life extension program and the new rail car program. So I am going to play his video. I've got IT uh, on, on standby. Uh, for any technical challenges, it, it is a couple minutes long, but I got permission since we're, we're the only briefing um, for today. My name is Jeff Cody. I'm a quality assurance engineer. Florida has a program for the life extension of our fleet of rail cars. It's important to increase reliability for our riding public. The 311 fleet started arriving on water property back in 86. So a 34 year old rail car, we needed to do something to increase the reliability for our riding patrons. So this life extension program is aimed at increasing that reliability. We load these rail cars, load them on trucks, ship them to New Jersey to 
have the overhaul done, and then they are returned on those trucks, dropped off, and it's my job to be involved in the inspection and testing of the cars. I've loved trains my whole life. When I was a kid, I had model trains. It's a fulfillment of my childhood <laughs> dreams to come in every day and be able to work on a full-size train set. You will make sure it opens and closes, and then it snaps back. During the life extension program, the focus has been the mechanical portions and the propulsion and the communications on the train to increase the reliability. The customer will not notice a big change on the interior of the car. All of these systems, the brake systems, the interior door systems, they're all being upgraded to ensure that we're not getting failures in these systems. <coughs> will help in the overall increase of uh, mileage we get on the main line. I like to come into work. When you like to come into work, it's not really like work. I've been at MARTA 23 years. My job is important to me because my friends and family ride the system every day, and I want to make sure that it's on time and safe for them as well as your family and friends. When a customer rides these updated trains, they're going to experience a smoother, more reliable ride. And that was Mr. Jeff Cody. We are so uh, proud of him and proud to have him uh, featured uh, as a martyr hero and uh, in demonstrating those uh, quality assurance services. Um, so that concludes my briefing for today. I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, Gina. It, it's perfectly obvious that you do understand this and place a high priority on it. And I, I commend the MARTA leadership team for going through this process. Are there any questions? We can yes, sir. yes, I have, I have a, 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 a comment and a question. First, I want to say this is a tremendous award to be ISO certified. Uh, I come Absolutely. from a uh, manufacturing distribution uh, environment, food, particularly in chemical in some places, where certification of the processes and um, documenting processes and doing audits to make sure that the processes are true and are, uh, are in place is critical to uh, an operation that, that you want to put your trust in. And this is, this is wonderful. I, I did not realize that uh, that that the model system and from your efforts is the uh, only one in America that has reached this type of certification, and that that is huge. And that means that you're taking care of the small things, and so and that and that's why the system runs well. And people wouldn't even understand it or wouldn't even recognize it because it, it, it because of the effort of what you're doing. I just want to say that's that's that is excellent. Uh, and I'm so glad to see this presentation. Um, and so my question also has to do with. Uh, you mentioned the the, uh, the SMS and the QMS systems together. So I know that the uh, QMS built the SMS foundation. So, but both of those were were both of those part of the ISO audit when when it was done, or was it just kind of a, a package deal that was done all at, at, at one package? Yes, sir. Um, first, thank you for uh, the complimentary sentiments. It is very much appreciated. Uh, this has been a huge uh, a team effort. Uh, within our department, so we are very um, appreciative of, of uh, the understanding of, of what it means to be ISO certified. Yes, um, our certification is solely with um, with the QMS. Um, actually, actually, SMS and our safety services um, is or, or safety uh, plan is is part of our our services out of that. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the QMS, uh, I, I guess I would say by default kind of encompasses um, that as, as one of our services, um, but it, but the certification is QMS itself. It just really um, uh, makes us ready uh, and, and gives us a, a very solid foundation as we go forward with, with implementing SMS. It does, it does. Wonderful, wonderful job. Um, uh, Thank you. I'm excited to see this type of, uh, this type of effort. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Are there any other comments, questions? If not, thank you very much, Gina. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Gina. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for all your hard work on this. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate it and appreciate the support. All right. Can I have the agenda back? 
<clears throat> Somebody put the agenda back up for me. Yes, sir. We're pulling that up now. All right. Uh, other matters. Uh, oh, uh, other matters. The uh, you have the key performance indicators uh, for your information. Uh, are there any other comments, questions, come before this committee? If not, could I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Got a motion. All right. Hey, got a motion. This is Dr. Redmond. Point, point, point of order. Yes, sir. All committee chairmen need to know you don't need a motion to adjourn. You just basically slam the hammer down and say <laughs> the, the, the committee adjourn. But uh, I don't have a hammer. All right. <laughs> slam it, Jerry. Slam it. All right. Hey, <laughs> you stand adjourned. Adjourn. All right. Bye bye. All right. Thank you. Right, well, we're ready to go right on into the business management committee meeting. Um, I'd like to call this uh, meeting to order. Uh, may I get a roll call of, of, of uh, members attending the meeting? Sure, Mr. Frierson. Roberta Abdul Salam. Robert Ash. Jim Durrett. Roderick Edmond. Present. William Floyd. Roderick Fison. Present. Ryan Glover. Jerry Griffin. Here. Frida Hardin. Here. Alicia Ivey. Russell McMurray. John Pond. Present. Rita Scott. Present. Christopher Tomlinson. Present. Thomas Wordy. Present. Mr. Fryson, we have nine board members present. All right, thank you very much. You are welcome. Okay, what we have before you, uh, I need a, a motion to approve the uh, the business management committee meeting minutes from June 25th of 2020. Can I get a motion? I move. This is Frida. Okay. Worthy seconds. Been moved and second. All right. Do I have to take a vote on this? Yes. Yes. You have to do the abstentions and the no's. All right. So is there anyone who abstained to the meeting minutes? Are there any objections to the meeting minutes? I'm hearing none and the motion carried. All right, we get into the exciting part of the business management committee. All right, first one is a resolution authorizing a modification in a contractual authorization for the automatic fare collection software. Uh, hardware and professional services, RFP P38189. Mr. Kirk Talbert is presenting with Rhonda Allen. You have the floor. Thank you, Chairman Frierson, Mr. Parker, Mr. Hurley, members of the board. Today, uh, I'm bringing to your consideration a request to approve the resolution to extend the cubic contract for a period of up to five years and to add value onto that contract in the amount of $52,417,439. To explain this, uh, I've asked Rhonda to join me and we're going to do a dual presentation explaining where we're at on the current fare collection system and our strategy and plans for the future. Okay. There we are. Is everyone able to see our screen? Yes. I'll turn it over first to Rhonda and then I'll come to address the resolution issues. Up here, Rhonda. Type or there you go. So you do that too. Okay. All right. Good morning, all. Uh, Chairman Frierson, Mr. Parker, and Mr. Hurley. So 
this morning, I'll give you a little bit of an uh, update, a project update on what we've been calling ASC 2.0. That is Automated Care Collection 2.0. 1.0 is the current system that we have with uh, Cubic that has been installed since 2006. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the foundational requirements for the new system, uh, some what I'm calling options, but maybe pathways is um, a better word, um, that are under consideration for uh, procurement for ASC 2.0. And then we'll discuss a high-level uh, roadmap for the next five years. So. The ASC 2.0, um, what we're looking for here is a, a modern state-of-the-art fair collection system that will do three things, enhance the customer experience, optimize operations, and reduce costs. So over the last year, um, we have established a steering committee um, that's comprised the members of the MARTA team from finance, technology, customer service, police services, Station services, which is a member of operations, as well as customer experience. So we, this team has kind of been working on this for about a year now. We we started uh, up in in July of 2019. Um, along with the senior leadership, we uh, developed guiding principles to kind of help us as we're going through uh, evaluations to kind of determine what it is and you know ask the questions that we're going to ask and make sure that we measure ourselves against um, when we um, implement uh, the next automated fair collection. Um, over the past year, we've researched industry trends, uh, investigated what other transit agencies are doing, uh, developed a five-year, which is a draft roadmap, and we'll talk about why it's a draft um, near the end of the presentation. And we're currently partnering with the ATL on regional fare policy and mobile trip planning applications as well. So the, uh, the guiding principles that we developed are, are shown here. In these are just, again, a checklist uh, of sorts to make sure that um, we're, we're getting the best product as we're developing um, our, our performance uh, metrics against um, ASC 2.0. So again, we want to either uh, to maintain or improve the fare, back, fare box recovery ratio, uh, create an equitable fare policy, and it does not mean that uh, we don't have one now that's equitable, but we want to make sure that any changes that we make uh, continue um, to be equitable um, to our customers. Uh, also, to enhance the customer experience, um, support rail and bus operational efficiencies. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Reduce the uh, capital operations and maintenance costs of the system. Support regional trips. Um, in, support the interoperability with regional partners and, and uh, TNCs. And then prepare us for the future um, new modes of service that we expect. So some of the foundational requirements. Again, I, I, I spoke earlier about three main uh, areas that we want to look at, and the first is the customer uh, customer experience. So the new system um, that we're looking at will be a account-based system, which means that information is shared or stored in an account rather than directly on the card, which is uh, the way our current brief system works now. Um, this in, in and of itself provides the customer with a little bit more um, self-service options. It will allow open payment acceptance. Uh, you can think of that as walking up with your um, your debit or your um, your credit card and walking directly to a fair gate, tapping it, and the gate will open so you can bypass uh, the vending machine. It will allow fair capping, which is a uh, best value option uh, in our fair policy. A virtual breeze card, so you can embed your breeze card into your phone. Think of it as having your so you may have your Kroger card uh, on your phone. Instead of showing that little tag on your keychain, uh, when you go there, you show your, your phone. So we'll be able to have our brief card uh, embedded in the phone. And then for, the, for our customer's sake, um, we would offer uh, a retail network for individuals who maybe start a trip directly on bus. Uh, they may not reach a rail station for a while, but it will be easier for them and more convenient if they can upload uh, or purchase Breeze Fair, uh, perhaps at a retail uh, location closer to home or closer to the start uh, or end of one of their trips. As far as operations is concerned, we want to make sure that uh, the new system is integrated with some of our other systems, uh, and one that comes to mind, uh, this top of mind, is parking system. Um, we collect revenue for parking, and we want the new system for ASC to be able to accept um, revenue from parking. We also want to maintain uh, integration with the current and maybe expand uh, regional partners. <laughs> and as well as make sure that we integrate with our transit management association functions. And that is a group uh, of vendors or employ employers and groups 
um, that provide discounts um, to their uh, employees uh, for Breeze, Breeze Systems, and they can kind of manage uh, those on their own through a website uh, a little bit more efficiently than they do um, now. That's our goal. The next item is to uh, reduce cost uh, when we look at this. Um, and that, <clears throat> the first one actually kind of goes to operations as well as cost, but we'll be looking at off-board payments and all-door all door validators. Um, that's really um, one of the best practices for um, bus rapid transit um, for efficient service. We would also look at a proof of payment system. Uh, if an individual is paid off, off board, then we would have to have a way off of a bus. We would have to have a way to make sure that their fare is valid. And so we'd look at uh, systems for ensuring that uh, we can inspect a fare um, as we move forward. With more payment options available, again, we mentioned uh, maybe using your phone or using going straight to a debit, uh, debit card or, or a credit card. Um, we expect that there will be a reduction in the amount of uh, TBMs or, or ticket vending machines um, in use at our station. That will mean that we could reduce the cost of operations and the cost of maintenance uh, of, on those. We could possibly simplify those TBMs. Perhaps there will be some that would offer um, or, or that will be cashless where you would just go and use your card. But again, all of those things we're looking for is to actually reduce um, the cost of operating those um, pieces of equipment. The same with cash. Uh, we hire folks to go out and collect cash. Uh, that costs money, and so with more options, um, more individual or fewer individuals may choose to just come up with cash. And so again, um, we want to provide equity to all customers. So we we don't want to leave out those who are unbanked, but definitely want to look at the cost of those things and perhaps um, reduce that. And then. Uh, we're also looking at upgrading the, the fare gates, um, maybe the paddles, some of the internal components, again, the, the fare uh, readers without a full replacement of, of that system. Again, I mentioned um, options under consideration or, or pathways. So at present, um, we are looking at uh, or considering three different pathways for moving towards ASC 2.0. One is a full wholesale RFP for system replacement. Uh, it would be a 15-year project. Um, it, in some ways, would give us greater negotiate, negotiating power than we have with our first uh, contract. We've learned a little bit because it would include uh, some maintenance in that contract, and we'd ask the contractors to include upgrades in the system as we start. Um, anyone, any vendor, any qualified vendor, even Cubic, uh, would be able to, to bid on this and could possibly win uh, this, this contract. Option or pathway two is to um, in include some current uh, or phase in upgrades um, that we mentioned before, like open payment acceptance, a virtual breeze card, um, and uh, things of that nature into our current, uh, with our current cubic contract. We're still, we're still looking at kind of timelines for that and what that would look like, and that could possibly be done as part of option one as well. And we'll look at that at the, in our next uh, slide. Pathway three um, would be using Controm, which is uh, the mobile ticketing uh, vendor, um, and they would offer they also offer uh, similar uh, products or enhancements um, using their their system. So we're at a point now where we're we're not ready to make a recommendation to the board as to which pathway we would choose. Um, we're still looking at financing options uh, for, for all of these systems because we're talking about systems that could be in the, the hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, here, and so we want to take a little bit more time uh, to evaluate um, some of the, the, the options available to us. And again, we want to look at the, the timeliness for some of the upgrades um, that folks are offering to us. Okay. All right. And then uh, option one, or recommendation, or, or pathway one, uh, again, in any vendor, uh, you know, um, could win could win uh, under this, this scenario, but I just want to kind of show you what the five-year plan would look like if we went with option one. So this year in FY 2021, uh, we will launch uh, Breeze Mobile and what we're calling Breeze Mobile 1.0. Uh, just for reference, it's the first uh, mobile uh, app that we have here for uh, making payments. We will be writing, uh, preparing the RFP for ASC 2.0. Um, we've already begun 
began some business process review, um, and that's kind of considering what functions in, uh, do we want to keep internally, and are there any functions that we want to give a, to a vendor that makes more sense for the vendor uh, to do for us. Um, upgrading, continuing to upgrade our network communication, because um, again, if you're, we're using an, going, moving towards an account-based system, we need to make sure that our uh, technology and our, our network can handle, handle such. Next year, uh, we hope to uh, award the contract. Again, since this is an RFP, it'd be more of a design build, and so we will go through the design review of the new system with the, con with the uh, contractor. Um, there may be some small modifications to our fare gates, um, keep them in a state of good repair. We'd be looking at adjusting the fare policy. Again, uh, one of those things that we look at is fare capping and how, um, how that would, um, would move into uh, the current system. Uh, 2023, uh, we would expect to see the virtual Breeze card uh, in play, accept open payment, and then Breeze Mobile 2.0 um, would be here. And Breeze Mobile 2.0 is would be either uh, integration uh, of the the new vendor if it's not Caps or Contron with the current system, or they would be required to bring in a new uh, system, but one that uh, would not be. Um, problematic, I would say, or um, one that would actually be kind of seamless for our customer uh, when seeing it. So again, Breeze Mobile 2.0 in uh, 2023. 2024, um, the entire account-based system would be available. We would have uh, new hardware installed. We need to have an expanded um, retail network available to us. And then Breeze Cart 2.0 would come online. With an account-based system, uh, we will need to have new cards uh, to be read. And so we will, we'll, we'll not have the silver cards that we have now, but again, an up, updated breeze card. And so that's what that, that means there. Um, a lot, all of this, again, into, moves, into a, moves us into our eighth guiding principle, which is uh, preparing us for new modes of service. And we're expecting in FY 2025, the Summer Hill BRT to begin. And so we'll be ready to accept uh, off-board payments using the system, uh, replacing fare boxes and some of the older uh, buses. Um, we'll launch the, the Transit Management Association um, business website. So again, those folks would have, those employers would have a more of a um, self-serve um, product available to them. And then we would move most of our other customers in, in, into this new system. 2026, again, we're accepting the system and then continuing with MARTA um, expansions into other realms, whether it's BRT or light rail or, or, or anything else that we have here. And so during this time, all this time that this is happening, we're going to be, you know, maintaining our current system, which is the cubic system, and so we need to continue the maintenance on that contract. And so that leads us into uh, Kirk's presentation uh, on the uh, the contractual um, hosting and, and um, professional services, hardware and software maintenance of the current cubic contract. All right. Is there any? Are there any discussions on this first? or would you like for us to just move forward, um, Chair, with the remainder of the presentation? Okay. Are there any uh, any questions concerning this presentation? Okay. All right, Kirk, you can go ahead and, and uh, talk a little bit about the RFP and what, what we're trying to achieve here. Thank you. Yes, certainly, sir. So Rhonda had the fun, sexy part of technology, what's coming down the line. In order to continue to collect fares for the next few years while we are moving to a better platform. Uh, the resolution in front of the committee today is to extend the cubic contract so that we can continue to maintain and operate our existing system during this improvement and enhancement. Um, and you can see here the, the current state of how long we've been in contract. We've been contracting with cubic since 2003 had multiple enhancements over the past expansions. <laughs> but our current cubic contract, which runs our current fare collection system, expires um, in September of 2020. That's both bus, rail, side, as well as streetcar, which was a separate contract uh, since we inherited our system from the city. We just talked about the new fare collection system and the timeline for deployment. So what we're asking for today is consideration and approval of a five-year cubic contract extension uh, structured such that it's three years for a base contract with two one-year options. That gives us the flexibility if we implement a shorter timeline for mm -hmm. a system 
enhancements that we would only need three years to implement. But if it does take the full five years, then we're prepared. The, uh, in, in addition to extending the time period on the contract, we also would be adding uh, dollar value to the contract to be budgeted operationally um, and through the capital program for the future fiscal years in the amount of $52,417,439. From a visual standpoint, uh, this diagram depicts what we're looking to do, taking the current bus and rail contract, the current streetcar contract with or, uh, Cubic, sorry, extending them, proposed extension for three years with two one-year options after that to take us out to uh, September 30th of 2025, potentially, while the new AFC system is selected and implemented. From a financial standpoint, here is a chart depicting the breakdown of the operating cost as well as potential professional services. The potential professional service line item there you see for $4.78 million is enhancements or upgrades that would need to be done to the existing system to keep it in compliance. For example, one of the upgrades that we're looking at is taking the internal operating systems of the TVMs and upgrading them for security and, and operational support purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that we're attempting to make wise investments in the platform because if we know we're migrating to another uh, TVM or gate system, we obviously do not want to make large capital investments in the existing system, but we do need to keep it operational until such time as we can migrate to the new mm -hmm. system. Um, so what you'll see here is approximately the first year is an $8.6 million expenditure, uh, slightly ramping up. Um, okay. You can see the, the years down at the bottom, the total amount. If we, in fact, execute on the professional <laughs> service, then it would uh, be the $4.7 million added to the operational rent. But the total amount, as you see in the bottom right corner, is $52,417,439. So that concludes the formal piece of this presentation. Are there any questions on the request for this resolution? Um, this is Chris Tomlinson. I have a question. Go ahead, Chris. Um, I want to make sure, I, I don't have any questions on the extension because I, I think based on what you're saying and what Rhonda said, you're going to need to extend the existing one to explore the options. Um, my, my question goes to, um, I guess, these hardware costs and Rhonda's comment about potential um, fare box upgrades. So does the fare box upgrades only happen under the option one of a new AFC 2.0 RFP, or is there a chance that the fare boxes are, are being upgraded under this cubic extension? So there is an opportunity um, to upgrade them under the current uh, offering, but that's not included uh, right now in, the, in what Kirk is presenting. Um, okay. If we move to uh, open payment acceptance with cubic, then we would upgrade our fare boxes um, with new readers, new card readers. Um, but we haven't gotten to the point yet where we've determined that that's the best solution yet. Okay, so th I think that addresses what was going to be my follow-up. So these hardware costs don't reflect the additional money that would be needed um, if you'd like to do a fare box upgrade under the cubic extension. Correct. If we did decide that we would move with some of the, the items under the option two that we have there, we would um, bring that back to the board for uh, for approval. Mm -hmm. Okay. And if I may, uh, Mr. Chairman, one last uh, question. Go ahead. Uh, Rhonda or Kirk, would you guys be coming back with a similar timeline presentation that you showed for option one, for options two and three? I mean, I think some of it was integrated, but I, I, I yes. Okay. Yes, I would expect within the next uh, couple of months we would come back and we'd give you a little bit more detail uh, on how we made our recommendations, our final, our final choices, and get your uh -huh. uh, your approval to move forward with our final strategy. All right. Great. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, any other questions? Any other comments? Okay. Thank you, Kirk, for the presentation.
I'm, trying, I'm ready for the resolution. Um, so can I get a motion to approve the resolution as it's been presented? Bill Floor. Bill Floor. Second. Can I get a second? Griffin, second. Okay, it's been moved and second. So all those who are uh, against this resolution that's been presented uh, by uh, by Kirk Albert and uh, Rhonda Allen, all those who are against it, I hear none. Are there any abstentions on the resolution? Okay, hearing none, then the, the resolution is passed. All right, thank you. Thank you, Kirk. Thank you. All right, the next resolution that we are going to be discussing is resolution authorizing the modifications in a contractual authorization for the maintenance support of the teller driver 8.16 driver management system uh, contract L3-9961. Kirk Talbert, uh, you're presenting. You have the floor, Thank Mr. Kirk. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Parker, Mr. Hurley, and members of the board. Uh, this is a request for approval of resolution to extend the contract that we have for the teledriver system. The teledriver system is the automated system that we use for timekeeping and uh, time management for bus operators, mechanics, journeymen, uh, and the majority of our represented employees. So it's the time system where they punch in, punch out, uh, take vacation time, whatnot. This has been a multi-year contract uh, that is expiring and we're requesting extension of the contract for three additional years for a dollar amount of $426,186. Okay, can I, can I get a... Um... A motion concerning the resolution? I move to approve. This is hard. Okay. All right. Second, second, Edmund. Second, Edmund. All right. All right. Any discussion concerning the resolution? Okay. Hearing none, can I get a motion? Uh, so, all those who are in favor of the resolution, I mean, all those who are opposed to the resolution, first of all, any opposition? Hearing none, any abstentions to the resolution? Okay, hearing none, the resolution is passed. Thank you, Kurt. All right, the next item on the agenda is a briefing uh, for the DBE program review. Ms. Paula Nash. Ms. Paula, you on? Mr. Farson, excuse me. We're at um, agenda item number four. Okay, I'm sorry, you, you are absolutely mm -hmm. correct. Yeah, I, I dropped down. So let's go back to agenda item four, the resolution authorizing the award of a one-year maintenance and support agreement for the Palo Alto Firewall RFP P46995, utilizing the Federal General Service Administration GSA contract. Uh, Kirk, you have the floor again. Thank you, Chairman Frierson, Mr. Parker, Mr. Hurley, and members of the board. This is a request for approval of the resolution to utilize the General Services Administration contract to enter into a one-year contract with Layer 3 uh, to provide us maintenance, support, and updates on the agency's 14 different firewall systems. So the agency currently has 14 different firewall devices appliances that protect basically there are our padlocks if you will on marta they protect our rail system they protect mm -hmm. the agency network the fair collection system cctv whatnot we have multiple contracts currently that are expiring at different periods of time and our desire is to go out and competitively find a single contract to support all 14 so they're coterminous and we have one vendor to deal with um, but in order to align those, 
multiple contracts into one, we would like to make use of the general services administration contract, which was uh, had pre-competition, uh, and layer three was the responsive and lowest price bidder. So in this case, we're uh, requesting extension for one year in the amount of $438,702.56. Okay. Hi. Uh, can I get a motion for concerning the resolution? This is hard as I move to approve. Move to approve. Okay. Can I get a second? Ripping second. Okay. Move to second. All right. Discussion. Yes. Uh, yes. I have a question. Yes. 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 And I think we touched on this just a yes. minute ago, but but if you could give a little bit more depth and substance into why it is that we have not really aggregated uh, these services before such that we don't have to rely on the uh, Georgia GSA. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. So we have um, acquired these firewalls over different periods of time. They were not all acquired at the same time. And as we've been improving the network, security and as we've been expanding systems, uh, developing interfaces with the city of Atlanta where we share CCTV feeds and whatnot, it required us to bring different firewalls on at different times. Because we had different vendors and we had different termination dates, going out and doing a competitive uh, procurement through our means would have taken, would have been a very challenging process to be able to align all of those. By utilizing the GSA contract, They've been competitively bid, the, the pricing has, it's market competitive, but it allows us to align all of those contracts at one time, which then allows us to go to the market and have a more responsive competitive environment. Um, to say we, we wanted to do each of them separately would have made it very challenging to get competitive responses uh, in the way that we were structured. Does that okay. answer the question? It does, it does, thank you. Okay. okay. Kirk, Kirk, I have a question. Um, so after this is all consolidated, uh, and so here we are one year after all this is done, you're saying now you can go into the marketplace and get a competitive bid for all these services. Uh, I mean, are there companies that can do, can, can do these services? I mean, it seems like these things have come from these proprietary companies that created these services and softwares, I mean, I mean, I'm just asking, I mean, is it really, is it reasonable to think that we can find somebody that can do all these services when we go into the marketplace? Yes, the, the short answer is yes. What happens, and not all software and hardware is done this way, but Palo Alto is the manufacturer of these firewalls. They do not sell directly to us. We cannot go to Palo Alto and say we want a year's support on a device. They sell it through value-added resellers, and there is competition in that market. You'll note that layer three is who is giving us maintenance and support. The competition comes in the value-added resellers competing to sell us that Palo Alto support. And their profit is the piece that's being played with in the market. Okay. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Can I get a motion to approve the, um, first of all, um, I'm admit this is where I've been moving second. All right, so the resolution is before you. So uh, all those who are against the resolution, are there any ones who are against the resolution? All right, do I hear any abstentions to the resolution presented before you? Okay, hearing none, the resolution is passed. All right, thank you, Kurt. All right, the next item on the agenda is a briefing. From the DBE program review, Ms. Paula Nash, you have the floor. All right, thank you. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. All right, I will share the screen. Okay. All right. There we are. So good morning, Mr. Frierson, Mr. Parker, Mr. Hurley, and members of the Business Management Committee. 
I am Paula Nash, the Executive Director of Diversity and Inclusion, and I am presenting the DBE Goal presentation. So every three years, the FTA requires recipients of FTA funds to submit a proposed DBE Goal based on the FTA's mandated methodology. Marta's goal is due October 1st, 2020. This presentation will be a quick review of MARTA's DBE program and the methodology of how we calculated the proposed triannual DBE goal, which will cover federal fiscal years 2021 through 2023. And the briefing will also give some uh, current information. Before I jump into the actual review of the DBE program, I do want to mention some current successes that we've had. Um, as you may recall, we had a successful FTA triannual review last November. Also, one of the things that we are currently doing is working in conjunction with the Georgia Minority Supplier Diversity Council um, on a mentor protege program. Now that program um, is in its infancy stage. We were getting started right before uh, the COVID-19 hit. So we're at the very beginning of that. I also, we also had a staff member who was invited to Entrepreneurs and Innovators Summit and Reception at the White House, uh, where Marta actually sat on a, on a panel discussion there. Um, and I wanted to let you know that during this pandemic period, we have continued to provide education and events um, by creating and providing a COVID-19 small business resource list that we sent to all our registered DBEs and small businesses. And it had information about loans, uh, resources, and business tips um, to help small businesses during this um, COVID period, COVID-19 period. And then since we have not been able to actually have uh, in-person events, uh, we have been having webinar events. And so we have had two of those events during the, the COVID-19 period. One was I'm DBE certified, now what? And that was a event uh, for newly certified DBEs and it focused on things like capability statements and marketing strategies. And then we had a second event uh, last week that uh, was re regarding um, doing business with MARTA and it was just regarding upcoming opportunities at MARTA. So uh, we feel like we're doing great things and we have more great things to come. Now, jumping into the DBE program, um, as we know, the, the DBE program is federally mandated. So who has to have a program? It's any recipient of federal funds who will award contracts in excess of $250,000 of those federal funds in a year. So there are four elements to the program. It's the program document itself the goal setting methodology, which is um, the primary focus of this presentation, monitoring and oversight, and the semi-annual reporting, where we report every six months to the FTA what uh, the, the DBE uh, contracts that we have awarded. So why is there a DBE program? Uh, we have the program to, or the FTA created the program to eliminate discrimination in awards of contracts, to level the playing field to compete for DBEs and small businesses, to remove barriers to participate, and to provide flexibility in providing opportunities for DBEs and small businesses. It differs from other programs in that there are no quotas, there are no set-asides, we don't have any guarantees of being able to participate, and there is no minimum participation. So what is a DBE? Um, 
The FTA considers a DBE to be a small business with at least 51% ownership held by an individual who is socially and economically disadvantaged. And this does include women owned businesses. Um, also that owner, that socially and economically disadvantaged owner must also control the management and daily operations of the, of the business. So you're not automatically considered a DBE just because you're socially or economically disadvantaged. There are other criteria such as US citizenship or lawfully admitted or being a lawfully admitted resident. You have to meet the SBA size standards. The gross receipt must for the company cannot exceed 23.98 million for DBEs and 52.47 million for AC DBEs or airport concession DBEs. Um, and the owner has to have a personal net worth of less than 1.32 million. So these last two things are important elements because many times I, I come before you and say there are no DBEs in that industry. For example, we, with new car dealers or with banks. And I, I wanna be clear, I'm not saying that there are no minorities in that industry or that, or that there are no MBEs or FBEs in that industry. There are just no DBEs in that industry. And usually that's because they have outgrown the program based on one of these elements. So sometimes we, we put zero goals on procurements and I'm sure you wanna know why. Generally, that is because there are no DBEs certified in the scope of work identified. Um, sometimes as, you, as you've just seen, we are getting the vendor off of the state of Georgia contract or the GSA contract and we can't uh, require them to have a DBE goal. Um, sometimes there are sole sources and so we don't put DBE goals on sole source contracts and the same would go for single source or emergency contracts and the rationale is, is simply that it's not a truly competitive process. And then for transit vehicle manufacturers, and that's our bus and our rail car procurements, um, we don't put DBE goals on those. And that's because the FTA requires the TVMs to submit their own DBE goal directly to the FTA for approval. So now we're getting to the, the three-year methodology process. And we start with looking at projects. There are forecasted projects. Um, so the projects being used for the DBE methodology are new forecasted projects where the FTA funds have already been awarded. So looking at these six projects I have here, I, I by no means am I saying these are all inclusive of what MARTA will do in the next three years, because we know that's not true. Um, we, we often use local funds on projects, but those don't get included in the, in the DBE goal um, methodology. And then there could be other FTA funds that will happen as the, the years progress. So this number, we could change this number based on additional projects, but right now this is what uh, the FTA requires us to look at. For the methodology process, we must determine the geographic market area, uh, which is essentially where we spend most of our funds. So for MARTA, we pick Fulton, DeKalb, Clayton, Cobb, and Gwinnett counties. We also use a few databases in our data, um, one of which is the North American Industry Classification System or the, the NACE codes database. We also use the 2017 U.S. Census Bureau, and for that, we use the county business pattern part of that. And we use the Georgia Unified Certification Program Directory, which a lot of times we just call the DBE Directory. So now, going through the methodology steps, 
And let me say, I'm, I'm giving you a high level kind of cliff notes version uh, of the process because the process itself is very extensive with a um, um, lot of math mathematical calculations. But for step one, which is getting us the base figure, what we do is we determine the ready, willing, and able DBEs within the, the DBE directory that's inside the market area that I mentioned earlier and that are performing in the same NACE codes. Then we use the Census Bureau County Business Practice practice database to determine the number of all ready, willing, and able firms within the market area performing work in the same NACE codes. And we divide the number of DBEs by the number of all firms. And here we got a base availability of 11.61%. So the next part of step one is to determine if the base figure needs to be weighted. So the point of weighting the base figure is to provide a more narrowly tailored model of availability. So here we, we did decide that the base figure needed to be weighted. Um, the weight used is the proportion of dollars spent in each industry. So that's the 27 NACE codes would, would be 27 different industries. So the proportion of dollars spent in each industry and the results are that the availability percentage is more heavily influenced in the industries where more dollars are spent. For us here, that would be in construction. And so what I did was there are 27 different NACE codes, but for uh, simplicity purposes, I divided it into three different categories, construction, wholesale, and other services. So the formula we use is the percentage of total FTA funds times the overall relative availability and in e that equals the weighted base figure. In this case, it was 14.29%. So this so slide shows that a condensed version of how we got to the 14.29%. So we just don't end, well, you could end with a 14.29%, but the FTA has you look to determine if an adjustment needs to be made to that base figure. And I determined that an adjustment did need to be made to the 14.29%. First of all, it, it seemed relatively low for, for MARTA's um, DBE goal. So we looked at making an adjustment to that. Um, although it's not required by the FTA, it, if you don't make one, you have to explain why. So the adjustment, and there's different ways you can make adjustments, but one of the ways that's recommended by the FTA is looking at historical data. So here we made a median past participation adjustment, and that is taking the last five years of DBE achievement, finding the median amount, which was 31% for us, and adding it to the base figure, then dividing by two. So with that, we got 22.65% for our DBE goal, which I rounded up to 23%. So after you come up with the proposed DBE goal, and I should say that the 23% is a proposed goal, it does have to get approved by the FDA. Um, the FDA actually requires you to do a race neutral versus race conscious split. Um, for that, we also looked at historical data and determined that the split should be 4% race neutral and the remaining 19% race conscious. Um, and we published this information, our proposed DBE goal on MARTA's website as well as required by the FTA. 
so so this slide actually shows historical data of what the goal was for the the last five years last five federal fiscal years and what marta actually achieved in the appendix i also show the data for what um the breakdown based on um the race neutral and race conscious but this is just the cumulative uh, data. So here on this slide, I and, and so what I just showed ends the methodology process. So Marta's proposed DBE goal for the FTA is 23%. This slide gets us to some of the more current things. So here I'm showing um, some significant contracts with DBEs. Um, and this by far isn't all the contracts with DBE goals, um, but some of the ones that you probably have heard a lot about because they're some of our more uh, significant contracts. Um, and one of the things I did want to point out is that when we set individual contract goals, we go through pretty much the same methodology that I just explained for the, the three-year goal. It's just we're doing it on an individual contract basis at that point in time. So I also wanted to point out some of uh, MARTA's DBE success stories. And, and these are various contracts that have exceeded the DBE goal. Um, as a disclaimer, there are probably other success stories, um, but these were the ones that we were readily, um, were easily identifiable as we looked um, through our database. Uh, you see some contracts there, mystery customer, uh, facility-wide janitorial services, bus stop amenities that have 100%. That means that they were a DBE prime. So when there's 100%, that's it. But as you will see with the other contracts, they there are some that you know have gone over significantly over the DBE goal assigned to that contract. And um, this was a snapshot kind of in time uh, at the end of uh, June. So I'm going to say June. 30th is probably the snapshot of, of these, the DBE goal achievement. So as, as with any time you have uh, successes, you also have challenges. So this slide shows some challenges that, have, that we've had. Um, and again, as a disclaimer, there may be other challenges that are out there, but these were the ones through our database that were uh, very easily identifiable. Um, there are a variety of reasons, challenges, so I'm just going to highlight just, just a few of them. Um, you see mobility service at the top uh, with a 20% DBE goal, but the what's been achieved so far is 11.79. Um, many of you probably remember that this contract kind of started out um, deep in the hole with a DBE performance. And I can say during the last two years, they have been exceeding the DBE goal, but they will run out of contract long before they ever meet the assigned goal. Um, so that's kind of what happened with that one. I, I also want to point out at the bottom of the contract, um, full line banking services. And I'm bringing this up because I that contract's going to come back up uh, before you um, pretty soon. But full line banking services poses an industry problem. Um, there's really no way to really slice up banking services so that you can track MARTA's money. For example, one of the NACE codes used for the DBE goal um, for full line banking services was. Um, armored car services. However, there's no way for us to really track um, if a DBE is used for armored car services, but more specifically, there's no way for us to track 
Marta's money and that it was used by that particular DBE or that there were no other entities out there whose money was also used in the armored car services, and I'm sure there was. So it's it's more of a tracking kind of uh, situation that keeps us from actually being able to um, monitor and tell the goal, uh, specific goal being met here in this pro in this particular procurement. So because of that, what we consider is good faith efforts and the company that the bank that has the full line banking services has a supplier diversity program where 30% of their overall business goes to a minority business. And because of that, we consider that they've met the good faith efforts, even though we can't track per se Marta's money or can't slice it up to follow Marta's money. So this slide just shows some of the education and outreach events um, that we've had in the last um, couple of years. You see on the left-hand side uh, shows the event that the Office of Diversity and Inclusion has done. Um, and it on the right-hand side, it shows our different partnerships and sponsorships. We use this as a way to provide education and to encourage DBE and SBE certification um, and we also partner with these different groups um, to also sometimes we do events in partnership with the different groups and we have them disseminate information which includes martyrs procurement opportunities to their memberships all of this is an effort to grow and diversify our dbe and sbe databases this slide just shows some narratives of some recent events that we've had, and I, I spoke of some of those um, at the beginning of my presentation. So the, the webinars and the business, small business resource list. And we also have industry days where we highlight specific industries and sometimes have the DBEs come in and showcase their products and services. And these are some other recent events, which I, I've talked about some of those already. So what are the next steps for our DBE goal? So um, the Office of Diversity and Inclusion will submit the proposed DBE goal and methodology data to the FTA. And and, and again, that proposed goal is 23%. Um, we will await the FTA's review and approval. And, and while waiting, MARTA will operate using the proposed goal effective October 1st, 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Paula. I appreciate it very much. A great deal of information. Um, I have a question. Uh, first of all, um, appreciate the briefing. Uh, one of the slides on the education and outreach. How are you navigating that now with this current health environment? Are, are these some of the programs still moving forward? Yes, sir. Some of them are moving moving forward. We've just had to do it um, not in an in-person uh, type way. So we've had to do it. We've had to learn how to do webinars and, and vir virtual education formats. And so that's what we've, we've done. And we've even um, we're about to start a, a new program, um, small business development program, and we're doing it in conjunction with the uh, with UGA Small Business Development Center. But that okay. also will be an education program that will offer uh, different things such as uh, bonding, insurance, education, proposal development, and that uh, joint venture uh, mm -hmm. information, that kind of thing. Okay. All right. Good. Good. That's continuing. Yes. All right. Board members, any uh, questions you have for concerning this briefing? Yes. Yes. Mr. Dr. Edmund, hold on. I got a call back. I'm going to turn this off. Hold on. I, I hope you all can hear me. Yeah, we hear you with the background seconds. echo in the background. I'm just going to have to turn this phone off. 
Okay, we can hear you now. And I know you all can hear me. Yes. And uh, wait for the phone to turn off. One second, I'm sorry. Okay, it's all. Anyway, I can't hear you all right now, but I, I hope you can hear me. There are a couple of points that I just want to want to raise. Uh, one, it, first of all, that was an excellent report, and it answered some of the questions that I had. And I I was taking copious notes, and probably three of the questions that I that I have written down, you've answered already. But the ones that were remaining, one, it'd be nice if every year annually we can get an annual report on the DB programs, really just looking at the demographics, race, nationality, gender, et cetera. And um, that data is important. And I want to just, just be real specific. In a number of places throughout the nation, not necessarily in transportation, you know, DB programs were, in my opinion, kind of abused because when they went back and looked at the demographic data, you know, it wound up being that 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 white women wound up uh, constituting the majority of the uh, disadvantaged businesses who got this business and who had, who had access to the program. So let's look at that data. It's important. The second point is that uh, we need to, in my opinion, better clarify what is required to establish the DBE goals. Uh, when you when we say 25 percent, does that mean 25 percent of the workers? Does it mean 25 percent of the subcontractors? Does it mean 25 percent, quote, ownership of the project itself? We need to be more specific. And again, and it, this isn't just particular to MARTA or, or transportation, but what I've seen in my experience is that uh, what people do to basically get around, from my, from my perspective, the spirit of the DB program is that they basically wind up hiring if you have a project to you know build a building, you know, 25 percent of the laborers where they're laying brick and concrete will wind up being minority. And they say that they satisfy the uh, the spirit. That, that's not what this is about. This is about basically uh, ensuring that that uh, companies who have been historically marginalized and haven't been able to really compete to get in the business side of it. They, they get in there. They actually have hard work to do. They have managerial and project experiences that they can build upon. And they use that in order to basically propel them to be able to compete at a higher level. Uh, right. The third point I want to make is that um, and I'm just and, and this is pertaining to to Marta and, 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 and I want everybody to, to remember it. Now, I've been on the board now about a decade and I've seen the whole DBE initiative morph. It, it fluctuates their highs and their lows. Uh, I've seen the DB program, in my opinion, historically, there's been a lot of, of, of abuse of, of the program. And when I say abuse, uh, that means that, you know, a contract will come out and that contract, uh, they will say that, 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 that there are no, <clears throat> there, there, there are no uh, DBs in that scope of work. And then they'll use that basically to go and get on the GSA list and access the GSA contractors. And then we sit back and look at it. And this has happened. I'm not going to go into the details, but people who are on the board remember them specifically because I called it out. You know, I mean, there, there, there were certain certain services. There was nothing special about these services. There was nothing particular about the services. This was just staff members being lazy. And I'm calling a spade a spade. And they really had not prepared. They had not basically set it up in order to put forth a competitive bidding process in a timely manner so that we can have our services on time. And in panic, they said, okay, let's go get, go get GSA. And then when they went and got G GSA, you know, they, they wound up using that justification saying that there are no DBEs were in that scope of work, which was just patently false. So I, I just, just, I want you to understand the history of what MARTA has been through as we move forward and I hope we don't revisit some of these some of these instances and then the last point and this is something that's come up within the last six months to 12 months but Marta we have been in discussions I know I brought it up multiple times at either committee meetings executive sessions or whatever but 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 we must have some type of punitive or disciplinary policy to deal with contractors who violate the DBE goals uh, that, that thing with the uh, with, with MV 
and then basically, you know, using a minority vendor to get the business. And then once they got the business, they cut them out and marginalized them. And they basically were acting as though Marta wasn't going to do anything about it. That's got to stop. Okay, it can't happen. That cannot be the narrative that people assign to MARTA in terms of our DV program. We must have a clear and concise punitive and disciplinary policy to deal with contractors who basically just, you know, for lack of a better word, pimp these, 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 these minority contractors, get them to get the business and then try to flush them away and wash them away. So those are my comments. I cannot hear you until I get back on my phone, which is creating that huge echo. But that that's all I have to say. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Uh, Edmund. And I, uh, I'm sending him a chat right now telling that we heard him. Uh, so he'll, he'll know about it. Any other questions from uh, any of the board members? Yes, Mr. Chair, this is Rick yes. Scott. I have a couple of questions. Yes, ma'am. First, um, can you, uh, go in depth a little more and explain the mentor protege program sure yes i can and, and, and i'll ask my second question and then it's over to you and that is are you looking at means to overcome the goal challenges thank you yes okay so first i'm gonna your first question was the mentor protege uh program so what we've done with that is and and we're doing it in in conjunction um with the georgia minority uh, supplier diversity council but it, it is a program where we're actually looking at marta uh, procurement. So, so here actually the ones that ended, ended up getting picked, and like I said, it's in its infancy stage. Were I think our CMAR project um, and maybe our A and E project with the station rehabilitation. But we selected some of our prime contractors who have been, you know, kind of doing business for, with Marta for a while, and asked them to team up with some fairly new DBEs that aren't doing things at, at that level, um, aren't doing projects at that level to just it, essentially show them the ropes. Now with the Georgia Minority uh, Supplier Diversity Council, there's also education involved. So they have to take certain classes, th these particular, um, um, the uh, DB, newer DBE. So they take classes as this goes along, but they are, are working with well-established primes to just um, show them the rope, the ropes and also educate them. It's kind of just that hands-on experience. And so that's one of the programs, uh, the new program that we just recently started, actually it hasn't started, it's supposed to start in May and then it got pushed back um, because of the COVID, but is with, again, with the UGA Small Business Development Center and theirs is called the Prime Development Program, but it's a very similar program and where some new, um, not necessarily they are new DBEs, but DBEs that haven't um, reached that level of being able to go for the big projects, particularly as primes, and uh, we're working with them to just kind of build them up to and educate them to be able to get to that level. I hope that answered that question. And then yeah, I, somewhat. Okay. okay. Um, your second question was means to overcome uh, the li the listed goal challenges. Okay, the listed goal challenges. Sure. So the the means that we use to overcome that is we generally when we see that there are um, are primes that are not meeting the DBE goals and it doesn't look like they will meet them or are coming even close to meeting them, we bring them in and we start having regular meetings with them. Sometimes it's a quarterly meeting. Sometimes there are some that we actually have monthly meetings with in an effort to find out what is 
what's the problem? What's the holdback? Now, sometimes it's been so a couple of the ones that were on that list, it's been that they that the DBEs have pulled out of the out of the um, procurement or out of the contract. So it's getting more, uh, you know, going out and finding other DBEs to then help reach the goal. And so we do that by providing a list of all the DBEs within that particular industry code to just help them um, be able to find somebody to reach the goal. Um, if it's a situation, and this is the case of one of the individual on one of the companies that's on that lease, it was the tire uh, procurement where they literally there's all, there were only about maybe a handful of DBEs that that did that type of work um, uh, on the database, and so they literally contacted all of them. And either the DVEs were conflicted out because they were doing work with competitors or they just weren't able to take the work. And so that company, um, on advice of us, they actually in an ad in the AJC to say they had received uh, this particular uh, procurement and that they were looking for someone to actually join them in almost like a joint venture to, to work with them in doing it. And they got no answers to the ad. And so ultimately, through doing all of that, we consider that to be that they've met good faith efforts. But we try to work with all the companies to make sure to help them reach the challenge to overcome the challenges. Paula, can I just can I just add a, a couple of quick comments? This is Jeff. Um, uh, because you specifically asked about the uh, the Georgia Minority Suppliers Diversity Council that, that Stacey Keys uh, leads. Um, had a meeting with her just prior to really COVID-19 hitting and, and we've had a good conversation, although it's sort of been put on hold and, and I know there's been some very recent reach out to, uh, to uh, kind of do some additional um, connections with them so that we can make sure that the uh, not only MARTA, but the, the, the larger primes that are working at MARTA um, are, uh, you know, participating in that really, really valuable program. I've, I've seen some, some firsthand um, experiences where, where, where small, small firms have really um, significantly benefited from the, the program that, that the primes and that the Georgia Minority Suppliers Diversity Council puts together. Um, and, and then the other thing is, is you know, I think, I, I think a, a key piece of, um, of, of identifying the, the issues and, you know, I'll, I'll thank Paula for her um, engagement around this is, is just making sure that the leadership team um, knows about and is willing to deal with um, issues that, that arise. And I think I think the uh, the MV is a you know a a good example of that. I I think you know we we would all agree that that we were as an organization too slow to deal with that with that issue. Um, while it's you know while it's been been turned around recently, it's it's not where it should have been. We took some you know decisive decisive steps to uh, to, to mitigate that, but. Um, you know, Paula has a, a, a good understanding of her role of filtering these issues up so that, that um, if a middle level manager isn't actively dealing with something like that, that the leadership team here at Marte is making sure that we're, we're you know, intervening and, and making sure and, uh, and, and, and making sure that we don't have to get to those punitive right. steps because mm -hmm. that's, uh, I think we would all agree that's, that's the last thing we want to do. The, the first right. thing we want to do is have success around this program. That's correct. That's correct. Thank you, Jeff. Any other questions from the um, members? Any other comments? All right, Paula, thank you very much. A lot of information. We thank you. And uh, once again, we just look forward to this program growing and being impactful. That's what I want to see. Okay. Thank you. All right, thank you.
All right, so uh, next on the agenda is just some other matters. Um, FY 2020 May financial highlight and uh, financial performance indicated some, some, um, some information there. Is anybody, is anyone going to share anything with that one or was just for information only? I see. Yeah, that one, that one is informational only uh, as is the, uh, the letter in, in regards to an upcoming, uh, intention for uh, us to use a GS, I believe in this case, it's a GSA contract that we'll be bringing uh, to, to the board. That's just a reminder that, that what we're doing is before we bring these items to the board, we're, we're including a, uh, a notice to the board so you can see when we uh, intend them as opposed to just bringing them directly to the board. Right, right, I see so that. That's, that's what that, that final item is. Thank you. All right. Uh, any other questions or comments from the board? All right. We're hearing none. Uh, this, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Is that the last meeting? Yeah, that is the last meeting. All right. <laughs> Take care. Thank you. Have a good time. Have a good, good okay. one, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.